Hello, dear class, dear poets. Uh, it's nice to be talking to you. I shouldn't be scratching my nose with my hand. Or maybe, have we got past that point of not wanting to touch our face? Maybe with, a, with an ungloved hand. Maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Anyway, um, it's lovely to be talking to you. And I've uh, received uh, 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 an email from all of you now. And it made me realize that you're not all simply sitting there in Brooklyn uh, like little birds uh, in the nest awaiting the mother bird to arrive with, in the form of a video. Um, what do they bring, the, the birds? Worms, yes. So you're not, um, in fact, for all I know, none of you are in Brooklyn. Anthea, in fact, is in Oregon, which is a wonderful thought. This is the great thing about uh, distance learning, because I realized today that now that um, uh, CUNY has put out a, a, a diktat uh, saying all teachers over 50 shall teach remotely, I could be anywhere. I could be in Iceland. I could be in my native London. I could be sitting in Berlin where my youngest daughter lives. I could be in Oregon, a wonderful place where Anthea is seeking a job as a wine steward. Good luck with with your interviews. This is fantastic. Um, but it, I realize that it puts this class somewhat in the pale, and I wonder really how much I should reasonably be demanding of you, because um, somebody else, I forget who Tiffany maybe uh, mentioned that, she said, I've been working. So you guys are not uh, lounging around. I do realize that. So I'm going to say a few words about Celia Bland, whose poetry I hope you will read uh, uh, over the weekend, and please uh, don't don't rush at it. Uh, poetry is to be sipped, um, and Anthea, who very sweetly said, "Yeah, I, I've been through it. I found it. I didn't know where I was. I, I got out the other end, and I, I'm not sure what I just experienced. Maybe I, I, you know, I'll feel differently about it the second time." But Anthea, as a wine steward, you wouldn't recommend when somebody is choosing their wine that they drink the entire bottle in the process of trying to decide whether that's the wine they want for the evening. I mean, you could, but it's not the recommended way. Likewise with poetry, um, and th that applies, I'm afraid, to all of you. Sip it. Uh, as I shall be sipping your poetry, and you will be sipping each other's poetry. So I want to say a few words. Um, I have here, uh, close by, um, I have to look across to my other laptop, because I actually have two laptops, which is quite an exciting thing. And you will see that if you read uh, the preface to uh, this volume of poems, Cherokee Roadkill, the preface by the great poet Robert Kelly, who has published, I think, more than 100 books of poetry, one of the greatest living poets, uh, uh, English-speaking and English-writing poets. And Robert says in his preface something wonderful about how I can't find it, I don't seem to be getting it, <laughs> about how she manages to capture the moment uh, so swiftly, on the hoof, and yet with such profundity. And that's a wonderful way of describing it. These poems are not, really like all poems, are not there for you to determine their meaning or what they have to say to you. Uh, literature doesn't have meaning. In fact, literature uh, detests meaning. Uh, and if it isn't, if it, if it actually doesn't detest meaning, it isn't literature. It's something programmatic, like politics or philosophy. But literature concerns itself with a world that is not literature's to pronounce on, but yours. And uh, if you were to write a review of uh, of Cherokee Roadkill, as many people have done, um, you might find yourself saying not, oh, this, uh, this book tells us X about the life of Cherokee Indians or Y about the life. They, you'd say, this is a book of poems set in a world, a world whose features are the elements, the cruel elements of uh, the life of American Indians. Now, I use that term instead of Native Americans, and you might be thinking, oh, how politically incorrect. Actually, Indians themselves, 
vastly prefer to be called Indians. They find Native Americans condescending, because we're, it's us uh, uh, white folks um, trying to uh, uh, raise their status by giving them a, a new name or an original name or a name that actually doesn't make sense because everybody born in America is a Native American, as American Indians are well aware. So they, as I know personally from uh, it, it, American Indian friends, they would rather be called American Indians. Very troubling for um, nice liberal uh, white folk who think of games of, of cowboys and Indians and how demeaning the word Indian is. Well, take it from Indians. <laughs> it's not demeaning. So um, here's a, a, the op just consider the opening poem is what I'd like you to do uh, so as to sip and not to rush into the volume. Uh, she starts this whole volume with a poem called Car Crash. This is very evocative for me. Uh, some dear friends of mine adopted a full-blood Apache Indian, uh, Jamie, and, and raised him and I knew him well and one day in his later teenage years he got badly drunk, as many uh, Indians do. They're, they're very susceptible to alcohol, and they don't. their system doesn't uh, uh, consume it uh, very well. And he drove home along a road I know well on the eastern shore in Maryland, and he just missed the bend completely, just drove straight on, where there's uh, a dog's leg, a sharp 90-degree turn followed by a sharp 90-degree turn back. He just drove straight on and straight into a tree and died there. Uh, so for me, it's very um, affecting. And if you know anything about um, American Indians, you will know how much um, car crashes uh, feature in, in the, the terrible sagas of their life. Alcohol, too. And so here's a poem, As It Happens, by Celia, which starts, There was the first crash. And we think, oh, God. Yes, there are and will be many. Where well, my cousin crimped like a dog's ear the phone pole, phone pole. We talk about crimping an ear when we sold it. They cut him from Chevy's metal skull with oversized shears, those giant shears they use to free people. Teen King Stanley, my man, cracked up. This was in Kalawi, Valley of the Lilies in Cherokee, an infinity for braves, where they could suck lily sweetness through ochre nostrils and hunt the buck again. Stanley's buck teeth through as gouged asphalt, not hunting the buck at all, uh, as he unstrung my pretty crew-cut redskin. Chevy's radio tuning Grand Funk Railroads, I'm your captain. So cool, this engine Sunday school aid. Broken. A resident scotch taped Stanley's backbone to the buckboard, inflated his lungs with a bicycle pump. I guess that's, I guess that's for real. While we women, Bonnie, Sharon, my mother, myself, keened by hospital bedpost, him singing until his eyes bent like lilies, and we set him, thighs set, ankles set, wrists set, Adam's original rib set, in collar we again. Jaw strung shut, pursed lips, a bottle cap about to pop. Stanley thought, I love how Stanley's in, alive in poetry time, not dead. Stanley thought, memories are a way to hold on to time, but who holds on to me? Who is brave enough to let me go? He drank those 13 beers through a Dixie straw. I don't know if you've ever considered uh, drinking alcohol through a straw. It's an absolutely fatal way of doing it uh, in terms of getting you very quickly drunk. 13 beers. Uh, the Impala crumpled like Kleenex in the second crash. Color we, color we. So we've now got another crash, different one. This one was well, for Chevy as well, uh, Chevy Impala. Crows scavenge his teeth for brackish nests, and the new moon will not, will not, 
will not set. Have I missed out? No, that's that's, the, that's the, that wonderful ending. Will not, will not, will not set the new moon, which will not go down on the eternity of of this event. Um, a beautiful poem, and like many of the poems in this uh, volume, full of sadness. It's a uh, it's a tragic world, the American Indian world, on and off the reservation. Um, uh, sorry, Tissue Lipstick Kiss is the next poem. Underscore the leaving of what outlasts flesh and blood. The high lonesome of my mother's agile hollering. Only heating the living room. Plaster excreting mouse fur. Moth tufted chairs, more horsehair. Boxes left behind by previous inhabitants, hand-carved shelves from Tuscaloosa, tatted lace, beveled carte de visite, as it incurs, of pulchritudinous women, rigid in corsets. Pulchritudinous, pulchritudinous. Pulcha is the Latin for pretty, beautiful, pulchritudinous. Underscore fingers, Raining buttons snipped from discarded clothes, buttons pinned to skin pale cards, yellow ducks in sailor caps, pearl sized, sorry, pearlized knobs. What outlasts, outlasts flesh and blood? What's left when someone's died? Mormor's cedar closet, Mormor's mother, grandmother. Flesh-coloured stockings dangling four garters, nude weave at heel and toe, tissue, lipstick, kiss. So it's a little um, hymn to the things that outlast us. So enjoy these careful poems, uh, and I, I shall want to ask you what the world is, really, that she's describing. It's a world that she was raised in. Celia, to, if you met her, is she doesn't look like a squaw in a, an Indian movie. She's a, a very decent looking, nice uh, um, middle aged lady uh, of, of, of great sweetness and depth of wit and humor. And she looks like, as she, well, she might. Anybody else she teaches um, poetry and, and other things in the English department at Bard College, uh, which means she's very smart. Um, and she writes about uh, the things from her, her childhood which have been meditated for a lifetime uh, to extract an extract of Indian life for you, a version of the American dream gone wrong, uh, and uh, to know a little about the history of uh, the Indian nations uh, in, in the America uh, that was invaded by the colonists is to know how deeply in America cruelty, fear of the others, attempt to dominate, hatred, how deeply that runs in the American soul. Out it comes, out it has been coming ever since we arrived on these shores and the last Ten days have been a terrible witness to our inability uh, to tackle uh, the horror of our racism. So these poems can be read through a lens supplied by George Floyd. Um, but they're not outwardly political poems. They're poems of the heart, uh, telling stories of the heart. And I hope you enjoy them. Um, and I shall be in touch with you again after the weekend. Uh, have a good, safe weekend in Oregon or wherever you are. <laughs> Dear Anthea, I had no idea. So exciting to me because you know, I could be in London and you wouldn't know. Nobody would know. But I'm here, actually, in upstate New York, uh, where I'm happy to be. So be safe, be wise, be careful, and... Uh, uh, you will see my uh, my goofy mug again next week.
Bye for now.